Uh-oh, we're recording. Like all, uh, like all of our institutions, of course, TCC had to scale up our online offerings um, as a result of the pandemic, something that we're all familiar with. And so one of the things that we um, wanted to be able to do, and I just lost a little bit of my screen. Hold on. There we go. Um, my notes suddenly disappeared in front of me. Uh, we had to scale up our online offerings during the pandemic and saw a, a huge increase in our um, online enrollment as a result of that. And so um, uh, college leadership decided that we needed to take steps to ensure that our students had the support that they needed, um, that our online learning division had the resources it needed, and that our faculty had um, ample development opportunities, as I'm sure is true of your institutions. A lot of our faculty had taught online before, some had taught in blended environments before, but certainly many people had not yet had those experiences. And so we needed to ramp that up quickly to make sure that we continued offering um, just a top-notch experience for our students. Um, what that led us to was uh, implementing a, a rather innovative, for us innovative, online course peer review process. Uh, that helped ensure the quality of those courses. That went into the uh, into effect in the summer of 2020. And the concept was that instructors who were new to online instruction um, would receive a course review from someone who already did have that experience. Fast forward to last fall, fall of 21, um, we made some revisions to that process and have institutionalized it as an online course peer review program so that every faculty member that teaches an online section both reviews and has one of their own classes reviewed by another faculty member who also teaches online. Um, it was a process that went through our Academic Affairs Council, um, was approved um, last April and is now something that's ongoing within the institution. Um, as I said, after that initial rush to get people prepared to teach in the online environment, we took a step back and examined the process, what was working, what wasn't working so well, and we determined that scaling up the peer reviews could actually serve some really essential functions of our online program. It provided us a way to ensure all faculty teaching online courses were familiar with best practices. It allowed those teaching online to apply those guidelines through the process of a peer review. It gave our colleagues the opportunity to explore how other colleagues structure their online courses. It certainly started a lot of conversations about online learning, and it certainly was a, a means of obtaining some really um, valuable feedback that Dr. Campbell and her team have been able to address um, through various um, programs and offerings and professional development opportunities through there and through our engaged learning division. So there's been a lot of faculty input to this process um, through our academic council approval process. Um, and now every full-time and adjunct faculty member at Tulsa Community Colleges, uh, Community College participates in that annual peer review activity. Um, I'm gonna turn things now over to Dr. Campbell to really walk you through uh, how this process works. And uh, again, we'll just take the opportunity to thank um, Jennifer for her great work as a faculty member who's our online learning coordinator um, and all the support and resources that she's helped provide through these last couple of years in particular. So Dr. Campbell, I'll turn things over to you. Great, thank you. And um, if, if, if anybody has anything that they wanna comment about, the rest of this is the, is going to be talking about our experiences with uh, peer review, but if anybody has anything that they want to stop and say and talk about, you're certainly welcome to. I know this is the last session of a great conference and Friday afternoon, and <laughs> I'm sure that people are um, ready to talk about things a little bit, maybe more than listening to things. But anyway, um, so some of the things, and of course, I am a faculty member and I thought, how in the world are we ever going to get faculty on board to do these reviews and do them enthusiastically? And I was probably not the biggest proponent of this whole initiative, but I have come to realize that this is serving many functions for our institution that is making our program stronger and is putting us in good shape for answering questions about um, ongoing and regular interaction, because that, that's a question that all institutions that receive federal funding have to answer. And this is one way that we can 
make sure sh- that we can it's a it's a piece of the puzzle it's not the answer but it's a piece of the puzzle so so um there have been a number of times where i've gone i'm really glad we have that peer review process in place because i think it's going to help us with the number of things in particularly accreditation um so we have gone with kind of the quality matters type of approach where the reviewer is taking the student perspective when they review and that they're using a checklist to determine essential course elements are in place. Um, And with that, that means that we were able to make it a fairly simple process. Everybody who teaches online is going to review a course. In our initial round, we kept people in the discipline so that they were reviewing somebody in the discipline, but we have since gone to out of the discipline or well, we've gone to random. So I guess you could be in the discipline, but it's most likely you're not going to be. Although it was amazing. Some people got the same person two years in a row. It's like, you should enter a lottery. Um, but, But we chose to do it that way because of a number of reasons. One, we thought that people outside of the discipline might be in a better position to approach things the way that a student would. And our process is not about the content. It is about navigation. It's about practices with grading. So it's more than just design. It is delivery and design. But it's just the approach that we took, and it seems to be working better for us. Initially, when we did it in the discipline, there were some, I think that the potential for hurt feelings is greater. And um, just because people are so close to the subject matter and so invested in what they do, and then they see what their colleagues are doing, it can help, it can hurt. But anyway, the, the approach we took was to do it out of the discipline or random. Um, and we like the student perspective because that's what we're doing is we're, we're looking at the courses to see if um, what we can do best for the, the overall experience for the student. The focus is on communication, navigation, course structure, clarity of assignments, um, instructions in general, accessibility, and then we have delivery. So people are able to see the grade book and they are able to see if regular um, feedback is being updated. Um, But it does not address breadth and depth and rigor of the content. And so we didn't make a commitment to be looking at those things there. It could be that some disciplines do that on their own, but online learning is involved in that. Um, so the peer reviewer process allows each faculty member to receive constructive feedback and to see how other faculty members design and deliver online courses. We also made a decision that these would take 60 minutes or less. So if somebody was looking at the checklist and they did they weren't able to get through the whole thing, then we're going to say, okay, well, then they've got substantial information to offer on a few things, which is better than no things. Um, and we, we just tell them that it has to be 60 minutes or less. And that's because we have adjunct faculty that are doing this. And I don't know what it's like at your school, but our school is not, the adjuncts aren't compensated at a huge high rate of pay, and we didn't want to overimpose on them. But we did definitely want them to be in the process. Um, and we did, it, initially it was going to be every semester, but we went to an annual review, and I think that that is is. Um, I am glad that the faculty requested that we make that change. I think that we would get burned out on this process if we did it every semester. So it is possible that a person could teach one semester and not the other semester and not be included. But for the most part, I would say 98% of our people that teach, teach every semester. Or if they don't teach every semester, they don't teach regularly. And they just wouldn't be included. Um, So our checklist that I can show you, 
And um, I will add this in the chat at the end. There it is. Okay. Our checklist is really a simple one. Is there an inviting welcome to the course? Does the instructor have an introduction? Photos or videos are recommended but not required for a we did in place, mostly in place and not in place for our ratings. Um, a statement in the syllabus that describes the expected response time to emails. Um, that's in our syllabus template anyway, so that should be there. A statement in the syllabus about turnaround time for feedback and assignments. That is something that comes out of the Quality Matters standards. And it is probably our number one item that was not in place for people. So that helps us know that maybe we want to look at our syllabus template and make some suggestions for people to put that in there. The initial communication provides an explicit, explicit reference to where in the course students go to get started. The course menu is logical, no duplicated items. The order of the items make it easy to find things. The naming structure shows consistency between the schedule, course menu, assignments, and grade book. And that's a hard one, too. There are lots of times when people put something on the schedule, and then when you go to find it in the course, it's named something different. And then when you go to find it in the grade book, it's a third name, and they're all kind of close. But we think that making those consistent is a big uh, service for our students. Um, and we, we give some suggestions there, find the course schedule, look at the assignment activity names and compare the names on the course menu in the content areas in the Blackboard Gradebook to ensure alignment. Um, each chunk of content has an overview that includes description of content and structure. So what we're looking for there is if you chunk by chapters or weeks or um, units or modules, that when the student opens it up, it's not just a bunch of links, but there's something that tells the student in this chapter, you're going to do da 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 da. And here are the links, or here's how you progress. And we want to know that students can receive ongoing regular feedback to know that they're on, on track and to prepare them. So that's a design issue. And um, is it designed that this student? is um, we're looking for if there are just four high stakes tests and there doesn't seem to be any formative assessment. So we're looking on is formative and summative assessment built in. Um, we wanna know that the grading criteria is clear. We, we are a school that uses Ally. So we're looking to see that the majority of the assignments have the green dot rather than an orange dot or a red dot. And we did work hard to come up with a role in Blackboard that would let people see what they need to see, but not let them change things accidentally. Like, could somebody get confused and do something? And, and we, um, we couldn't get the ally report to actually that was the one item that I couldn't get the role to quite work. But everything else um, we got that this that people can't copy or edit any of the content. And that can happen accidentally. So we felt strongly about that. But that meant they also can't view the ally report. Um, and then as far as delivery, we want to make sure that there that that people are have regular um, ongoing announcements and that the grading follows the feedback plan in the syllabus. So um, these things help us in a number of ways with just one is making sure, I think you need to have, a. I think all schools probably struggle with how do people know what the best practices are at the school? And this process allowed us to 
not only, as, as Dr. Stone said, not only are they looking at the standards, but they're actually applying them. And that way, we can say that everybody at TCC that teaches online in the fall semester knows what type of expectations we have in an online class and they know uh, and that they've applied them. So they haven't just read them, they've applied them. We don't know that they all do them, but that is, um, but that they apply them. We chose to make this a collegial approach. And so the person that is providing the feedback is expected to provide the report to the person that they they reviewed and offer a time for them to meet if they want to. That is one of our moving forward areas. We'll be doing a little bit more to make sure that that is known. It appears that some people skip that step and we'll have people write to us and say, hey, whatever happened to that um, review of my course, I never got anything. So we've had a few of those and we know that we've got some work to do there. Um, and as we move forward, we, we have, I think one thing that was nice about our process is we built into the beginning that there is a suggestion box for people to make suggestions to the process and that it didn't have to be the way that it is now that we, that we were open to changes, but we did have to put something into place and um, this was our attempt. And we did get 90, oh, I just put it up, 95%. So out of the 283 people that were part of the first group, 265 of them, I think, were our numbers that did complete. And we got um, a lot of comments that, that were helpful to the faculty that we thought were particularly helpful to the faculty member that was reviewing. Like maybe they saw things that were helpful to them in their own instruction. So the process worked for us, particularly for our adjunct faculty who aren't always a part of, oh, just things that you do every day at your job. Um, they got to see a different perspective on how to organize and run an online course. And we got, um, so we got a number, we could see from the reports that a number of people saw things that they incorporated into their own practice and people did a, a really good job with providing suggestions in a collegial manner. We decided um, that we would not be doing, at first it was, if you don't get, 85% or if you don't get X percent, the, these things were things that we expect to be in every class. So if you didn't get 100% or 90% or whatever it was, then you will be put on this list and you will have to have another review next semester was the initial. But what we went with in the end was this is a step added to all the other measures that were already in place and it is collegial and the reports go to online learning, we store them, and we provide them upon request to deans, which we've had very few requests for. So for the most part, it is, we didn't want to be the, this number of people were at a certain score because it is just ongoing feedback and a way for us to make our standards known and a step above what we were doing pre-pandemic, um, but it wasn't meant to be a something that required a score. And when we did require the score the first time, what we found was some of the, the um, people that scored low were because the reviewer really didn't follow the guidelines. And so that was the other part of it. So that's where we are at today. And um, Dr. Stone and I welcome questions and conversation. There is our contact information. And if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to take them now or anything that you wanna add that you're doing at your school. I can see there are a couple things in the chat.
Um, Oh, I do have one. How does this work in concert with faculty observations? Is it in addition to them or does it replace them? We have a hard time with observing faculty observations of online classes. And we do also have a faculty observation process and that is a different thing that is done at the discipline, that is done as part of the ongoing portfolios that faculty keep where they choose their reviewers and where they focus in on a particular aspect of online or of their it doesn't it doesn't have to be online whatever they want to but there's a pre-meeting and the faculty member decides i want to work on this or whatever they want to work on and then the reviewer comes in and gives them feedback on that and then there's a post review this is a much less detailed process than that and um yeah we just got support for this and it, it was a bit to get this passed through our faculty association i'm it, well through our academic affairs council with input from our faculty association it was not without controversy but eventually it was done. So yeah, I get it that, that it's not, that peer review in general is not always wildly popular. Um, so Jackie just added in the chat, um, uh, one of the best practices students uh, uh, love are the tangible examples for each of the assignments and uh, posting uh, announcements on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree the, um, the oversight on um, the structure of the course. I work in the library here at uh, UCO and I help a lot of students who aren't familiar. We use D2L as our management and they're not, they don't know how to navigate the course and they're confused about where to find their assignments and things like that, so. Yeah, the, the reason that we stuck this proposal in to talk about this was Brad had talked about just um, some statewide initiatives for, could there be any collaboration between schools? And I thought, well, we're doing some of this. And I think he found that when he talked to other schools that we're not alone and that there are some good practices out there and maybe someday the peer review process will be all of us. Well, all everybody who teaches online in the state of Oklahoma can put their course up and somebody else will grab it. I don't know if we'll ever get to that point, but there's, you know, all of us are, we know that, that um, I don't know, it's sort of like companies coming. You kind of look at your course differently when you know another person's coming in there, even though it's not punitive, it's, you get good ideas and and you talk to your peers and you hear things like what, um, you know, like, yeah, I agree with that. Like Jackie said, that we're finding the same thing, this ongoing regular communication. So you just open up the conversation for talking about it. And, and I think conversation's really good and peer review is a means of this. Well, <clears throat> Jennifer, I think this is an amazing process. And one thing that I, I love that kind of pulls influences, I think, from QM and that I've learned a lot from QM itself is how to actually talk to faculty about recommendations for their course, because there's a very particular way that you want to provide helpful recommendations to individuals that gets them to listen to it. And I think that when you have a checklist like this, it's kind of a universal approach. It makes some of those things a little bit easier to kind of take in, you know, to say it's not something that's the way you teach your course. It's not the content that you're delivering. It's really that you you're doing some things that maybe we could change a little bit and make it a more seamless experience for your students. So they do what what you want them to do. Um, so I love this and I can't wait to see where else we go. And yeah, as you mentioned, I, we've seen other examples now that we've been asking about this. Uh, that have taken place. I know Seminole State College is another one that had a similar system underway and the rubrics look different, which I think is pretty cool too. You know, they each have their own goals as far as what they're strategically trying to address. Um, and I think collaborating on that could be a really interesting project. Yeah, yeah, we would be interested in, in what else can be done, how, how you can just open up those conversations. Um, do you, can we send you the handout, Brad? Do you post it in the Zoom 
because yeah, I can't attach it here in the chat. I don't. It's a little hard with the uh, Zoom events platform to do sharing. So please send it out to me over email. Okay. And what I'll end up doing is actually making sure it makes it to the website when we post our recordings out there um, in that archive. So yeah, that would be great, Jennifer. Happy to collect all that info. Okay. Yeah, I do have a link to it somewhere, but I, I, I was going to attach the document, but I can't. So, okay, we'll send it to you. Yeah, and just so you know, you all can conclude your session and hit the end button whenever you're ready. And this is actually the final session of the Learning Innovation Summit for this year. So thanks to everybody who's been persistent and stayed on the calls till then. And I think uh, I can't think of a better way to have ended uh, the event than something like this, Jennifer. So thank you and Greg very much for the great information. Yeah, we love talking about it. Thanks for including us. Yes, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.